Hunger, I believe, is even more important than intelligence. Intelligence is so important, but there are a lot of very intelligent people that never maximize their capability. How many know somebody very smart that can't fight their way out of a paper bag? Say hi. So intelligence is so valuable, but hunger is even more. And if you've come to a program like this, I know the hunger's there. But the second thing it requires is a massive amount of energy. Because what I've found in life is many times people have the ability to do things, they know what to do, they just don't do it. And a big part of that is energy. So when I was back there feeling the energy, got the music, it's so quiet in here. You're being quiet right now. Most of you are doing what you've done most of your life when you went to an education environment. And what is that? You're now learning the way you did when you went to a 20th century school. In a 20th century school, what do we learn? The bell rings and what are you supposed to do? Immediately report to your what? Position. And when you get to that position, you're supposed to sit down and start a conversation with the people around you. Is that right? You're supposed to initiate. Is that right? No. When you went to 20th century school, you were taught, sit down, be quiet, be passive, wait till someone tells you what to do. Today, if you wait for someone telling you what to do, if you don't talk to your neighbor, you're out of business. Who's with me here? Say, ah. So I'd like to change this because how many of you in this room have ever gone to an environment where you learned something that you thought was really, truly valuable? No one sold you on it. You personally thought this is really something that could change my business, change my life. You were excited about it. But when you went home, you literally never applied a bit of what you've learned. Who's ever done this before? Raise your hand. Say, I. Oh, come on. If you're not raising your hand, you lie about other shit too. Raise your hand. Say, I. Who's done this more than once in your life? Say, I. Who still feels intelligent? Say, I. So we're all smart people. Why would smart people learn something, get in an environment like this, and then not maximize it? It's because we've all been conditioned by our traditional education, which was designed back in the 19th century, 20th century, where you designed to get a job, where you were supposed to report in a certain position, someone told you what to do. Basically, it was an assembly line. Today, that's not true. So I like to break out of that because research shows if you sit and listen to me passively like you are right now, you're being very nice, smiling, nodding your head, being sweet. I appreciate it. But if you do that, research shows three months from now, you'll remember about 10% of what was said, which basically was wasting your time and wasting mine too. I don't want to waste yours, much less mine. So if you listen and take notes, it jumps up to the 40, 50 percentile, even if you never look at the notes again. Because just writing it down drives the groove deeper. So I'd encourage you to do that. I don't see many of you with any form of notes, but I know you have your phones. Some of you do, but if you have no notes, you must not have had a very high expectation of much value coming out of the session, clearly. But thirdly, if you physically engage your body, which is what I like to do, your voice, your body, your energy, engagement is part of what we're going to talk about here in business. It's the most pathetic level in a long time worldwide. Even though we have all these tools for productivity, we have all these tools for distraction. And as a result, most people are not maximizing. So if we want to transform, the thing we really need to be able to shift is get ourselves engaged at a different level. So what I'd like to ask you to do is from here on out, if you're willing to, is let's start with some energy. Because let me ask you a question. If you have two people in a relationship, let's just go intimate for a moment. And you have two people and both these individuals are really, they're in a magnificent state of mind and emotion. Their life is going beautifully. They're happy as could possibly be. And they enter a relationship, two really happy people. What's that relationship going to be like? You tell me, if you know nothing else, what kind of relationship is going to be if you've got two people in a great peak state? Tell me, what's it going to be like? Now, if I'm having a soliloquy, you won't get anything out of this. I'm asking you to not answer the question, just so you refer refer back to me or affirm, I'm doing it because if you sit passively, you won't remember anything. But if you activate your nervous system by raising your hand, by asking questions, by yelling out the answer, the energy will rise. Who's willing to do this? If you want to raise your hand, say, I. I spoke at an education summit for Microsoft. I also spoke at an education summit for Apple. At the, education for my, at the Education Summit for Microsoft, I would say that 70% of the executives spent about 70% of their presentations talking about how to beat Apple. At the Apple Education Summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their 
presentations talking about how to help teachers teach and how to help students learn. One is playing this way and one is playing that way. One is playing finite and the other one is playing infinite. Guess which one gets frustrated. So at the end of my talk at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. They gave me the new Zoom when it was a thing. And let me tell you, this thing was spectacular. It was the most elegant piece of technology I'd ever used. The user interface was incredible. The design was spectacular. I absolutely loved it. It was easy to use and it was bright and gorgeous and fantastic. It didn't work on iTunes, which is a different problem, so I couldn't use it, but, but it was amazing. And elegant, my God, it was elegant. So I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with a very senior Apple executive, sort of employee number 12 kind of guy. And, you know, I like to stir pots. So I turned to him, I said, you know, Microsoft gave me their new Zoom. And it is so much better than your iPod Touch. And he turned to me and he said, I have no doubt. Conversation over. <laughs> because the infinite player understands sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Sometimes your product is better and sometimes it's worse. The goal isn't to be the best every day. The goal isn't to, out, to outdo your competition every day. That's a finite construction. If I had said to Microsoft, I've got the new iPod Touch and it's so much better than your Zoom, they would have said, can we see it? What does it do? React, 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 react. Finite players play to, be be to beat the people around them. Infinite players play to be better than themselves. To wake up every single day and say, how can we make our company a better version of itself today than it was yesterday? How can we create a product this week that's better than the product we created last week? We also have to play the infinite game. It's not about being ranked number one. It's not about having more followers on Twitter than your friends. It's not about outdoing anyone. It's about how to outdo yourself. It's not about selling more books or getting more TED views than somebody else. It's about how to make sure that the work that you're producing is better than the work you produced before. You are your competition. And that is what ensures you stay in the game the longest. And that is what ensures you find joy. Because the joy comes not from comparison, but from advancement. Let me show you what turned my life every way but loose. Mr. Shelf dropped this idea on me, changed me completely, setting goals. Here's what can easily happen if you don't set goals. It's easy to let life deteriorate into making a living instead of designing a life. And we all have a choice, make a living or design a life. It's easy to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. That's easy. But the best advice I, I can give you on how to break out of that trap is to learn how to set goals. Mr. Shelf put it to me this way. He said, Jim, if you had enough reasons, you could do the most incredible things. I never forgot how he put that. If you have enough reasons. See, reasons will change your whole life. Mr. Shelf said to me, he said, Mr. Rohn, I think you've got plenty of intelligence, you've got plenty of talent, you've got plenty of ability. Probably what you lack is plenty of reasons. He said, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indication of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you're much smarter than your present bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. But of course, my first question was, well, then why isn't it bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons. You've got enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. So see, reasons can change your life. Here's what else I found out. 
Reasons come first, answers come second. You don't get the answers to do well till you get the reasons. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the answers and only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reasons. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends that keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey, not the money. Once in a while, somebody says to me, boy, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. That's probably why the good Lord sees to it they don't get their million, right? <laughs> They'd quit. They'd quit. Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. The secret to building discipline and willpower in your life. And this is gonna be a very short video because the answer to this is very simple. The secret to building discipline, willpower, is every single day, listen to me now, every single day, you gotta do something that sucks. That's it, do something that sucks every single day do something that's hard that's difficult that's uncomfortable that you don't feel like doing it but you do it anyways that's how you build and cultivate the muscle because that's what it is the muscle of discipline and willpower it's something that you build over time it's something that you challenge yourself and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger the more that you push yourself to do things that suck now the king of this is doing a cold shower Okay, cold shower. It's one of my favorite things I do in the morning. Very simple, doesn't have to be scary or that difficult. You take your warm shower, at the end of the shower, you turn the faucet on cold, and you let it run cold for 30 seconds. You count to 30, and then you turn it off, and you go about your day. That simple act right there, doing something that's uncomfortable, that sucks. You know, nobody that I know of enjoys taking a cold shower. There's a lot of great health benefits to it, but for the most part, it's doing something uncomfortable. That one act will build discipline and willpower and transfer to other aspects of your life. Now, maybe for you, it's making your bed first thing in the morning. That simple act, it symbolizes something for your life and it's building that habit of discipline and willpower. Maybe for you, it's going to the gym. Maybe it's eating healthier. Maybe it's meditation, something that so many people are afraid to indulge in because they get bored, but by training yourself just to sit in silence okay, without any distractions, without the TV, without social media, just being silent and focus on your breath for 10 minutes and disciplining yourself to do that, even if you don't want to do it, that's the point. That's why you got to do it, is to build that discipline and that willpower. Maybe it's waking up at six o'clock in the morning, setting the alarm clock, you don't feel like waking up, but you do. The more that you do things that are difficult in your life, that are challenging, that suck, that you don't feel like doing, the more that you build the muscle of discipline, the more that you build your willpower, the more you are disciplined in other aspects of your life and it transfers to everything else for you. So that's the secret. Do something every day, every day that sucks. I wanna know what that one thing is. Leave a comment below to stick one thing for now one thing, leave a comment, let me know what that is, and start doing that every single day. And I can promise you, your life will get better. I used to say one man built his house on the sand and the other man built it on the rock, but I overlooked the fact that the guy who built on the rock did not build on the rock because the rock was there. He built on the rock because he dug to the rock. When we are doers of the word, we will dig for the rock. If you are hearers of the world, 
word, you go for the promise without the preparation. But in, the, in being a doer of the word, you will prep for the promise because you know the promise is shut out. You, you, you know the promise is big enough that it justifies preparation so that when it does appear, it will not disappear. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. If somebody in here understands what I'm talking about. Look at somebody say, I'm working on something, I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I know, I know it doesn't look like I'm working on something because you don't see no bricks and you don't see no fancy doors yet. You don't see no gables yet, but I'm working on something. I know it looks like I got a big old hole in my yard, but I'm working on something. I know I don't have shrubs like he got. I don't have roses like she has. I don't have stone walls like he has. That's all right. I'm looking shabby, but I'm working on something. When I get through digging down to this rock, as soon as I hit her, God is saying it is worth it to hit the rock. It is worth it to look bad for a little while and come up looking good for a lifetime than to look good for a minute. I, I need some slow cooked people in this room. I need to, some people that's been through hell and back. I need some people that's been dug down to the rock and said, having done all the stand, I'm gonna stand anyway. Oh, <laughs> If you got a rock in you, give the Lord a praise right now. If you want to be able to get your arms around a big organization that produces, you got to develop the skills. You've got to put yourself through the early discipline. But now here's what's exciting about the discipline. One of my key phrases for the whole day. Disciplines work miracles. Disciplines work miracles. And here's the first piece that works miracles. Number one, do what you can. Do not let neglect grab you by the throat. Don't let neglect stall you on your path toward prosperity and health, being able to become powerful, influential, rich beyond wildest imagination. Don't neglect what you can do. If you can read, read. If you can change, change. If you can grow, grow. If you can take one step, take one step. Do not neglect to do whatever you can do at the moment. Of course you can't run a multi-billion dollar business today. Mark couldn't either 10 years ago. Mark couldn't either five years ago. But I'm telling you today he can do it because step by step, year by year, he took on what he could do. He didn't neglect it. He did the meetings he could do. He made the calls he could make. He read the books he could read. He took the classes he could take. And step by step, he got himself ready. I'm telling you, do not neglect to do whatever you can do because it'll work miracles of personal development first, productivity second. Now, do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. Hopefully you picked that up, especially from the president's team. That's how they got here with diamonds in their pins. They not only did what they could, they did the best they could. They've done the best they could. They've been able to do, and I'm telling you, that's why Herbalife has got this incredible reputation. They picked up Mark's challenge that said, let us grow. Let us start with easy steps first. Let's do what we can first. If it's a foggy night and you can only see 100 feet, how can you see another 100 feet? Answer, walk the first 100 feet. Walk as far as you can see, and then you can see some more. And walk as far as you can see, and then you can see some more. So what you've picked up here, just do it as far as you can see it. And I promise you, if you'll execute as far as you can see it, you'll be able to see more. Do that, then you can see more. And finally, get in tune of doing the best you can. And you'll have the activity that'll develop the disciplines that will set this sail so that you can say it doesn't matter how the wind blows. I'm prepared. The disciplines that work miracles, here's the real miracle that works so well in Herbalife. Investing life, one person's life invested in another. I'm telling you, you cannot have the potential for miracle with any simpler formula than that. Somebody who developed a testimonial and now invests that testimonial in someone else's attention, someone else's mind, gets them to think about it, gets them to respond to it. 
Now we've got the miracle called the new customer. Investing the opportunity, idea, and someone telling them the Herbalife opportunity, now we've got a new distributor. Disciplines create new life by investing one person's life into another person's life. That's why I came by today. Mark Hughes invited me to come along on this journey to let me do something so grand and so powerful, I would not have missed this opportunity to invest a piece of my life into this many lives here today. I'm telling you, it's going to work miracles. And I'm asking you at home, because our old life is not only concerned with our business and our customers and our distributors and our organization, all of the things that we're proud of and the banners and the flags and all the rest of it. One of the most important is to become valuable by discipline to your family. No greater place can you invest life into life than to invest in your family. Don't give your distributors the best of your attention and your family the least of your attention. Don't be careful with your distributors and careless with your family. Be just as careful with a child as you are with a distributor. Because sometimes we think about volume and we think about money and we think about income, so we're very careful. But sometimes the people around us who need this investment the most to create new life, sometimes we're a little careless about investing life into life when it seems like it's so close and it's so familiar, we don't take the time to study ways and means for the language and the skills to invest life into life concerning our family. Don't be short here. We gotta remember the most important person to influence is ourselves. If we can do that, then we can contribute to others in ways that give our life a sense of meaning and purpose. I really want you to get that in the end, the meaning in life comes from contribution, from knowing that you're doing something you believe in and that makes a difference. You've got to know your outcome. The more clear you are on what you want, the more you empower your brain to come up with answers. Clarity is power. You must get focused on what you want so that you have something that's the driving force behind your behavior. When you know your outcome, you've empowered yourself. You can either live your dreams or live your fears. And I think the majority of people actually are not living their dreams but are living their fears. So I want to ask you a question. What are your fears? We all have something that's blocking us, that's holding us back. And as we begin to look at life, what we realize is that the reason that most people are not living out their true potential and not doing all of the things that they would really like to do is because action. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. Here's what I'd say. I want to mention one of the myths, though, to start with. Yeah. Not a myth, but a step. I want everybody who's watching to, to remember one thing. The biggest myth you have, not the one that's been sold to you, that hurts you is... The average person thinks finance is so complex because frankly, the industry tries to make it sound complex. They use words that you don't know, so you don't know what to do. You know, what does this mean? And so what happens is we just give them our money and say, deal with it. And we don't realize that system has been set up. It's not an evil system. It's set up by corporations that are looking to maximize profit for those corporations. They're not looking out for the investor because this investor is second. And we think we're first and we're not. So the first piece is you've got to know that you've got to, you can't wait till you have a ton of money to start investing and think I'm not an investor. What you got to do is say, rather than my Apple phone, let me own Apple stock. Let me own a piece of all the best companies, not just Apple. I've got to become an owner or I'll always be in scarcity. If you can invest in business, even a small amount, you can grow. I don't care how small it is, but you got to automate it. There's a gentleman named Theodore Johnson who uh, is amazing. He worked for UPS, started as a driver, never made more than 14000 total in a year. That was his highest salary in a year. In his old age, he's worth $70 million. And how did he do it? All he did was what I teach is the first step is you got to take a percentage of what you earn and pretend it's a tax. You're never going to see that money again. You automate it, it goes straight to the investment account, and you never see it as money you can spend. He did that with 20%. He said, I can't save five. Somebody in his family said, if there was a tax, you'd pay it, and they made it 20%. When you save 20% and you compound it, it it's numbers are incredible. So 
I show people how to do that. But then the problem is if you do that first step, but you don't do the second step, which is become an insider yes. and understand the rules of the game. And the old adage is a person with money meets a person with experience and the person with experience ends up with your money. I and mean, that's how it works. So what are, I'll give you two or three of the myths real fast. One, this myth that someone says, give me your money and I'm going to beat the market. It is, it's just a lie. Warren Buffett made it clear it's a lie. Ray Dalio, one of the greatest investors in history. Uh, David Swenson, who has take, taken Yale's money, a billion dollars, and converted it to 24 billion in two decades. The greatest institutional investor in the world. They've all said it. Warren Buffett flat out said today, he said, listen, in my will, 90% of my money, all that money does not go with any mutual fund and go straight into the index. What the index is, you get a piece of all the largest companies in the world, but it costs almost nothing to get in. Because over any 10-year period of time, 96% of mutual funds will not even match the market. Now, you're paying for a mutual fund. What, what this means is you hire someone because you say, I, I, have a fa- I have a family, I have a business, I have a life. I'm not an investor. I'm going to hire someone who's a professional. It makes sense. They would do better than me. Unfortunately, that's wrong because what happens is, 4% of them will beat the market, but it's not the same 4%. Mm-hmm. So your chances of finding the right one, uh, if, if you ever played blackjack? Yes. So if you play blackjack, everybody knows you played for 21. If you go above 21, you're gone. If you get two face cards and they're sitting in front of you and you got a 20 out of 21, you got the chance to stay or say, hit me. If you hit you, there's only one card that will get you to the other. It's an ace. If your inner idiot says, hit me, you have an 8% chance of winning. You have a 4% chance of finding the right mutual fund. It's not going to happen. So what happens for people is they think they've been sold, we're going to do better, and they might for a year or two. But what matters, you live off the long term. You don't live off the year or two. And they just don't do it. Uh, Warren Buffett has a bet right now with Protégé Partners, which is a group that does hedge funds. And he said... You can pick five hedge funds. You can mold the best of them together. I'm going to own the market, which costs me next to nothing. You're going to get the hedge funds, which cost a lot. Ten-year bet, who's going to win? Put up a million bucks. Right now, they're six years into it. Warren Buffett's at 42%. They're at 12%. Just, Just crazy. So the second thing is after getting terrible performance, people say, well, you know, fees don't really matter. Or they'll tell you it's only 1%. And I, I ask people all the time, how much do you pay? And they go, oh, I don't know. Or they'll say 1%. 1% is called the expense ratio. That's like the edge of the sticker price. If you read that 50-page perspectives in your mutual fund, even one of them is 50 pages, which you won't, you'd have a hard time with a PhD figuring it out. In fact, there's a man named Hilton Smith, I quote in the book, who spent two weeks. He's got a doctorate as an economist. It took him two weeks to go through them all and figure out there are 17 different fees and Forbes says the average fee is 3.12. Now, if you're watching right now, I'm sure I've lost your brain with all these numbers. So let me make it real for you. 1% versus 3%. Big difference. Huge. Right? Here's the difference. Just like you grow by compounding like Theodore Johnson did, your fees also compound. And people don't know that when they hear that little number. So if you had t- three people and one gets 1% in fees, 2%, the other 3%, they all get the same return. They start out with hundred thousand dollars at thirty-five. For thirty years, they accumulate to sixty-five years old. Seven percent compounded. They all get seven percent. The only difference is the fees. And when they go to retire, the person at one percent in fees is going to have five hundred seventy-four thousand dollars. Hundred thousand to five seventy-four. Not about if they added not another dime. Pretty amazing. The person at three percent in fees will have two hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars. less money. If you want to win a race and you have a 100-pound jockey in the back of your horse or you want a 300-pound jockey in the back of your horse, fees at 3% are that. If I said to you, here's a deal, let's do an investment, and here's how I want it to work. You give me the money, you put up all the money, you put up all the risk, I'll put up no money, I'll put up no risk. If you lose, I win, and if you win, I win, and if you win, over the life of the time, I'll get 60% of what you earn. You'd say, I'll never do that in a million years. That's a mutual fund with 3%. It's one of the only industries on earth where they've confused this enough that we don't understand we're overpaying by thousands of percent. You could own the stock market, the S&P 500. You can own a piece of all 500 big companies through like the Vanguard 500. And you get the best of all the business, Apple, Exxon, all these companies. And it costs you 0.17. That, that means less than two-tenths of a percent. 
and you went to a normal mutual fund, you might own the same companies for 3.17. That's like buying a Honda Accord for 20,000 or 350,000 for the same car. If you pay 350,000, you pick up the person next door, pay 20,000, say, you go crazy. That happens every day with finances because people don't know how to look at this. So when they read the book, that will never happen to them again. Yes, it's possible that you can choose your future and direct the course of your life as you run toward your dream. It's necessary that you have goals, that you write those goals down, that you plan, that you think constantly of how you can begin to improve what it is that you're doing. If it's your presentations, if it's your recruiting skills, whatever that is, it's also necessary that you look for ways to always find a way to pull it out when everybody else thinks that you are defeated. That you've got to take personal responsibility to know that in order to become successful, you've got to make it your personal business to do it. But the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that some of you already know that it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business and I fell on some hard times and I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby and the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter and he gave me an envelope. And he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope and the envelope was from management that says, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now things are bad for me, but they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal or rob from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor, never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled educable, mentally retarded, but I kept running toward my dream. The enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. But my dream! The enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. And his son, John Leslie, poses a question. He said, when you have goals and dreams you want to achieve, he said, ask yourself the question, who should I count on and who should I count out? 
And so many people never achieve their goals because they have too many toxic, negative, energy draining people in their lives. And you have to have goals outside of your comfort zone that will challenge you because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. And you've got to have a mentor who's experienced, who, who's been there, done that. And, and as a result of that relationship, because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame, Muhammad Ali said, I'm the greatest, but he never won a championship without Angelo Dundee. And Michael Jordan never won a championship without Phil Jackson. So you've got to have someone that can see something in you that you can't see that 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 can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself so i would teach them the value of having a, a life code that life is an adventure and it's going to be a challenge and get ready to, because you're going to fail your way to success you're going to get slapped around by life and don't spend time complaining about it and telling everybody 80 percent don't care and 20 percent glad it's you <laughs> Dr. Alfred Golson, uh, who was since passed, was a very unusual guy. And he told me, he said, Mr. Brown, you have cancer. I said, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to, to have fear because you know, those three words, you have cancer, three of the most feared words in seven different languages. I saw it as a fight. And 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 from that time to this time, you know, my PSA was 2,400, and that's after prostate-specific antigen, and, and now it's below zero, and metastasized the seven areas of my body, which was a good thing, because seven is my lucky number, <laughs> okay? So, it, the, no, I, I, I never was fearful that I was going to die from it, and, and I think that I read something by Dr. Norman Cousins. He wrote a book called The Biology of Hope, and he talked about the fact that when something happens to you, you don't deny it, you defy it. And I was defiant. That I'm going to beat this. I'm going to handle this. That there are people who many times when something happens to them, that they embrace it from a place of fear and it takes them out. And Elsie Robinson said, things may happen to you and things may happen around you, but the most important things are the things that happen in you. And you have to stand up inside yourself and deal with it and handle it. So fortunately, that never bothered me, but I had sciatica pain. That had me speaking in unknown tongues. <laughs> and I was in a wheelchair for several months, speaking from a, wheel, a wheelchair. And it was something that I, I dealt with that frightened me. Will this ever end? It was 24 hours. I lost a lot of sleep. It was exhausting going from all types of specialists in and out of the country. And just one day, it stopped. And I'm glad that I'm past that, you know. I just, I, I feel like uh, uh, when, you, when you go through some stuff, you just, uh, some certain things that you don't want ever to see again, and that's what I want to ever see again. But fear has not been the biggest challenge that I've faced with the things that I've been dealing with in terms of my health. Well, talk to me about the process that you go through mentally. So there have been a few times in your life in getting to know your story where you seem like really key inflection points, um, being told that you were teachable but mentally retarded, that for sure is something that would define most people and they would have a hard time escaping that. Um, being told that you have cancer, that it's stage four, that um, they don't know how to treat it, like that's something that consumes most people. How do you build that resilience? So maybe by the time you get to cancer, you've already done so much work, so I get maybe how that one you're, you're protected by the mechanisms you've built, but in the beginning, how did you crawl out from under the labels that people were putting on you? The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. What's the difference? 
Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you, and it's it's something that that's holding you down and you're not aware of it. Um, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead was in a restaurant in London, and and a guy was serving her and said, "There are several Americans here tonight." And she said, "Is that right? Yeah. So let me know when you serve the dessert. I'll tell you exactly how many are here." He said, "Oh, you couldn't possibly." And so he came back and said, "Okay, I've done it." And she got up. She walked around, and she came back and she said, "There are around 25 here." And he looked at the roster. How did you know that? Say, so in America, we eat differently from you when we eat a dessert. You eat it from the crust toward the tip. We eat it from the tip toward the crust. When you eat a slice of pie, how do you eat yours? I uh, definitely yeah, from the the tip back to the crust for sure. Yeah. Okay. And so, so there are things that when you in in my situation, when you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself, and and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process. Discovering the truth of who you are, and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. I speak to audiences around the world, and I and I train speakers as well, and I, I tell them that when you speak, that there's a, there's an objective that you want to achieve when you speak to an audience, because how people live their lives is a result of the story. They believe about themselves. So, you as a speaker, when you speak in this program, when people see you, what you do is distract, dispute, and inspire. You distract people from their current story with your guests and the questions that you ask. Through the process of the ongoing questioning and the way in which they respond and the things they have learned, you dismantle their current belief system. And inspire them to to create a new chapter with their lives, and so. But that's an ongoing process of of constantly interrupting the conversation, what psychologists call your self-explanatory style, because life is is going to beat up on you in so many ways, and many things they come back. You know, negative thoughts and and how you feel about yourself, they don't die. They, they come back once you stop doing the maintenance work on your mind, listening to motivational messages, going to seminars and workshops, spending time quietly listening to the still small voice within.、Uh, who am I really? Is this really me? Am I giving my best?、Uh, am I just reflecting what's around me? Because all of these various things. Affect how we show up in life, and so having a strategy to continuously find ourselves reaching higher. Robert Shuler had a book that is not very popular, but I loved it. It's called Peak to Peak. U P E A K to P E E K, because you're constantly reaching higher to find out, discover your your better self. This is a time where you have to be. Hungry, <laughs> because the over, according to Department of Labor, over twenty thousand people lose their jobs every month, and being replaced by artificial intelligence. And so, I used to sell television sets. A guy named Sam Maxwell knocked on the door. Hello, hi. Would you like to buy a good working television set? Nobody down. And、they say no. You're going from door to door, and and he would call the guys together when it gets so late and say, "Okay, we gotta go." And he would call everybody to the car, and he said, "Wait a minute, come here. Hey, Leslie's not here." And and I can hear him saying, "Hey, Leslie, come on, come on to the car." And I said, "No, Sam. Why not?" I said I'm not going to stop until I sell a television set. I haven't sold yet. No, nobody's sold anything yet. I don't care, Sam. I've got to do this. I made a commitment. I'm going to 
make enough money to put groceries on our table. And, and I would knock sometimes 10, 30 at night and, hey, would you like to buy a nice working television set? No money down. Do you know what time it is? Yes, I do. I'm going to buy groceries for our family. Somebody's going to buy a nice working television set from me tonight, and it might as well be you. And they say, come on in here, fool. It better be a good one. <laughs> so I learned how to be unstoppable. When he came to pick the other guys up, we had to wait till they got dressed. But I would be standing out front looking for him, waiting, because I was hungry. They were getting money just to have a good time to party on the weekend. I was earning money so that we could eat.